bumblebees have enemies, both small and large. If they have to defend themselves, they will, using their powerful sting. This is it, our last Transformers movie before I can finally move on to other dumpster fires from Hollywood. And honestly, as you may have been able to tell from the thumbnail and title, I actually like this one. Now, I wouldn't say this concept verbatim could be recycled for multiple Transformers films, especially not a full-blown epic like Michael Bay's entries. But with that said, as a small coming-of-age story, this is pretty good and really works. It also is probably worth noting that this film wouldn't be great for continuity nuts. It pretty much breaks all of the Bayverse continuity. But honestly, I prefer it that way. If we had devoted time to breaking down the mythology about how Bumblebee fought in World War II, or how we see radically different character designs for Autobots like Wheeljack, who is young in this one yet elderly in Transformers 3, while other Autobots seem not to have changed or aged at all, or how Autobots land towards the end of the film, including Optimus Prime, it would ruin the relatively quaint, easy-to-consume film this is. So for all intensive purposes, this is its own standalone thing outside of the Bayverse, and that's how I'll treat it for this film review. Anyhow, as per usual, the plot. Bumblebee starts with this really cool scene of the war for Cybertron, and the Autobots, including Bumblebee, are told by Optimus Prime to flee the planet. Bumblebee is told to establish a base on Earth by Optimus, with the rest of the Autobots to follow soon. We then meet one of our antagonists, Jack Burns, as portrayed by legendary WWE wrestler John Cena. Bumblebee lands, and John Cena and his team pursue, followed shortly by Blitzwing, who's a Decepticon seeker, and let's be honest, a pretty clear insert for Starscream, but he's not Starscream, so they can blow him up. He blows up. We then meet our human character, Charlie, who wants a car and is trying to fix an old Corvette her and her father worked on when she was a kid. She also has some built-up tension with her stepfather and mother. Anyhow, she meets Bumblebee and her new friend, Memo, and they teach her how to enjoy life again and get along with her mother and stepfather more. Concurrently, we have a villain plot with John Cena and the military teaming up with Shatter and Dropkick. However, John Cena is skeptical of Shatter and Dropkick, even pointing out the name of their faction, the Decepticons, probably isn't really trustworthy. Imagine the advances in the lines with these creatures might bring. I imagine the advances. An advance on Washington. New York, an advance on Chicago. It's not gonna happen. They literally call themselves Decepticons. That doesn't set off any red flags. Anyhow, Shatter and Dropkick try to cast a signal to bring more Decepticons to Earth, but are ultimately stopped when blown up by Bumblebee. Bumblebee has to leave Charlie, but Charlie learned to enjoy life again. The characters in this movie are actually pretty well fleshed out. I'm not going to call this film a challenging character study, but it's fun and it leads to relatively nuanced characters. I think the reason for this is twofold. One, there's less of them. Charlie is very clearly the protagonist of this film and isn't bogged down by too many side characters, and the ones that are there, while well established, are not overly focused on, just enough to get to know who they are, but not enough to get in the way. And while we have several Transformers in this film, Bumblebee is the clear focus of the Transformers shenanigans, allowing for a more fleshed out character. And two, this plot is very character focused. It's not about an epic battle or a MacGuffin chase. It's a simple plot about a girl learning to enjoy life again. It's a coming of age tale. Even the Transformers plot really takes a back seat to this. I think if you come into this film hoping for epic fights and a big adventure on caliber with other Transformers movies, you'll be disappointed because that's not really what this is. Anyhow, let's break down the characters. As for Autobots, we have Bumblebee. In this movie, Bumblebee is a young yet loyal warrior. However, he's not exclusively loyal to the Autobots, as when he meets and befriends Charlie, he forms a pretty strong connection with her. I like how once Bumblebee loses his voice box in the initial fight against Blitzwing, he actually slowly learns to use the radio to talk, rather than just having the ability initially, and it never even gets to the level we see in the first movie. I thought this was a pretty neat attention to detail we wouldn't often get in the original installments of this series. This also causes Bumblebee to have to portray his emotions mostly without speech, which I think they executed well as it has some Wally vibes to it, and I have to give a lot of credit to the animators for pulling it off so well. If I had one complaint though, it would be that Bumblebee seems to get younger after he meets Charlie. He seems like a competent warrior on Cybertron, and then when he comes to Earth, he's doing things like hiding behind rocks because he doesn't think transforming would be a good way to hide. 
I think this adds a level of boy and his dog story, which we see pretty often. Fine. You can play. except this time with a giant robot, which on its base is good and I like, however it does kind of suffer when it removes some of the character's competence as the movie goes along. I also think his relationship with Charlie is better fleshed out than his relationship with Sam or Cade. We really only know he's friends with Sam and Cade because the film says so and he shoots stuff with them around. In this film, we're given a lot of time to develop that relationship before any fighting actually happens. Cliff Jumper. I wanted to talk about Cliff Jumper in his own little slide because he has about 3 minutes of screen time yet feels more fleshed out than most of the Transformers in the Michael Bay entries. He's brave and won't sell out his friends even when tortured, and while that's all we see, I feel like the G1 designs help him emote more and make me feel more for him because it's easier to choreograph what he's feeling in the scene. Again, I think that's in big part because of the animators, so once again I have to give them kudos for that. Optimus Prime is just Optimus Prime, not the psychopath we get in the Bay entries. No, Optimus! He really doesn't do much, but I did enjoy that they actually wrote him as Optimus would often be written in the source material, despite him just being a cameo essentially. We also have several neat cameos from Transformers such as Ratchet, RC, Wheeljack, Ironhide, Soundwave, Ravage, Shockwave, and Starscream. It is really cool to see these characters in their G1 designs. The scene where they all show up is also a brief yet fun fight scene that is full of fan service but doesn't last long enough for it to interrupt the flow of the film. It's also a pretty neat sequence. It makes me want a War for Cybertron movie, which apparently Paramount announced as a fully animated prequel to the Transformers series called Transformers 1. So if that ends up happening, that'd probably be pretty fun. Anyhow, as for the more fleshed out Decepticons we have, Blitzwing, a G1 style seeker who clearly takes a lot of inspiration from the original Starscream design as I've said before. While he doesn't do much more than fight Bumblebee, he's pretty cool and I really liked seeing that design in live action. Shatter and Dropkick are our main villains and they hope to call more Decepticons to Earth. They're pretty cool but they didn't really do a ton and aren't super well established. That said, I don't really mind, I wouldn't really consider this film a hero villain story at least in a traditional sense. So not having the most development is fine when they're essentially just background characters to the main plot. Now for the humans. As I always say, they're the real focus of these films, and if anything, that's the most true in this film. Let's start with Charlie. She's the protagonist of this film, and I have stated a few times throughout this video, I actually really appreciate the character they present here, and the main reason for this is because unlike Sam or Cade, she actually feels like a protagonist. While the previous two protagonists in the Transformers films had problems, most of them were fairly superficial. Take Sam in the first film. He's an awkward teenager, albeit a slightly perverted one, who's frequently subjected to Freudian slips. What does Sam need to achieve? It doesn't really seem like he has a larger goal or an underlying motivation besides wanting a car and a hot girlfriend, both of which he quickly achieves with the help of Bumblebee. Following that, he's pretty much just strung along for the action scenes. There is also an argument to be made that he isn't really the protagonist in that film, since his plot gets a similar amount of screen time to the military or hackers. Don't fall for that, all right? That's why they fool. So they put the plate of donuts out here to test your guilt. If you don't touch it, you're guilty. I ate the whole plate. In subsequent films in the trilogy, he has more screen time and is the definitive main character, but it's all fairly unclear what his personal investment in the plot is besides Bumblebee is my Transformer. In contrast, when we look at Charlie, her plot flows in a much different structure. Her friend with Bumblebee and Memo helps her come to terms with the death of her father and helps her become happy again, which helps her repair her fractured relationship with her family. While she does want a car, that is more of a framing device for her to end up meeting Bumblebee than her entire motivation, like it seems to be Sam's in the first Transformers film. Her motivations make her much more relatable and easy to invest in than Sam, who is more of a wish-fulfillment point-of-view vessel than a character in his own right. This is not to say her plot is perfect, I think it feels a bit rushed as one minute she seeks to pretty much undermine her family and their wishes, then ten minutes later she realizes their value. Though I think the family's arc is ultimately taking her more serious and helping her save Bumblebee. 
which was a fun way to show this progression, although I think it could have just been portrayed better after the climax. Memo is kind of the love interest, but mostly just a friend of Charlie's. After stumbling upon Bumblebee transformed at Charlie's house, Memo is thrusted into this adventure. He is somewhat cowardly and is the comic relief, but he isn't really annoying, just more bumbling and awkward. I enjoyed the role reversal that Charlie and Memo have. Charlie fits more into the mold of the masculine character we'd see in a lot of similar films. She's confident, cunning, and she even has more masculine interests like cars, while Memo is more feminine and cowardly. While they don't do much with him, it's nice that he has a brave moment and something of an arc throughout the film. And I enjoyed the fact that they forgo the traditional love interest role at the end with him and Charlie just remaining friends. It's something not a lot of films cover, and it's nice to see that this film foregoes the whole trope of, well, we almost died together, so let's get in a relationship, despite that aspect of their characters being underdeveloped, like in the original Transformers film. Jack Burns, as portrayed by John Cena, is kind of the Sector 7 guy of this film, and while he doesn't come around to being a full ally like Sector 7 guy, it's nice to see some level of nuance where he doesn't really know if hunting Bumblebee is truly the right cause. It's not hugely developed like most things in this film, but it's clearly the case and makes him feel like a bit more than the cartoon supervillain he could have easily become. Jack is also kind of the comic relief, and John Cena does a really good job with the material he's given, and actually gets a few laughs out of me. I really like seeing wrestlers cast in these cartoony roles, especially the big ones like John Cena or The Rock, because they're often able to really chew the material, and it makes for some really fun moments. Oh, I should have let you die, Grenada. If you did, you wouldn't be able to come to the forest, run around and play these awesome games. Exactly. Ah! Oh, I hate you. Wow, man. That hurts, because I love you. But you refuse to let it in because you got intimacy issues. This movie has an interesting tone that really separates it from other films in this franchise. While those are very plot-driven epics, this is a fairly quaint coming-of-age boy and his dog film. Another apt comparison is an E.T. or Gremlin-style film. All of which I think must have been inspirations as it has a really 80s coming of age feel. While this certainly makes the film less epic than the other films, it allows the viewers to get more invested into the struggles of the characters which I really appreciate. If the Transformers films are for you, you might not actually enjoy this film as much as I did. And that's fine, it really ends up just being viewers' preference and what they want to see. For me, I'm more into character films, and while I can enjoy action spectacles, for me the Transformers film tend to be a little too much spectacle and not enough character. I think that's what makes the tone of this film so interesting, as I feel for some, this would be by far their favorite, and for others, the polar opposite, surely because of the presentation. It almost becomes more based on how someone watches movies than the quality, necessarily. I think it's also worth mentioning the 80s setting which it was set in is done with a lot of grace. In a post Stranger Things world I feel like a lot of films set in the 80s or 90s are just doing that for the novelty and if that novelty becomes too self referential it can take viewers out of the film and gets too much into that oh yeah I've seen that before mentality. While this film certainly has a handful of those moments it mostly dodges that potential pitfall. Here. Try this. It is also neat that it was set in that time period because it allows for the nostalgic G1 styles and designs. While this could have very easily been eye roll it was handled with a level of grace and nuance. Yes, it was referential, but it wasn't rubbed in your face. If you were unaware of the Transformers' larger history, you wouldn't feel like you're missing something with these designs. To you, it would just seem like an interesting redesign, and I appreciate that. I'm going to skip a good stuff slide for this review because I covered most of what I would say before, so I think it would kind of just be redundant. Okay, here's the bad stuff. I think this film could have been just a tad longer. I would have liked to see just a bit more of Charlie and Memo's relationship, as well as Charlie's relationship with her mother and stepfather, which while we get a pretty good taste of it at the start, it wouldn't have hurt to see a little bit more of them trying to relate with Charlie and failing. We also could use a bit more in terms of the villain plot, and I think we could have seen more John Cena being conflicted about the side of the conflict he wants to align with. Hell, I just wanted more John Cena in general because he was a lot of fun in this movie. I also felt the end was a bit rushed. It got what it wanted to say out, I just wish we got a little bit more.
Bumblebee was a good time. I could definitely have seen this film made in the 80s. It has a real Back to the Future, Gremlins, or E.T. feel, and I think it's fair to put this film in that category. And as an homage to that era and genre of film, I think it nailed it. All of the characters are really fun and well fleshed out for what they're going for. It's also kind of cool to see the Transformers genre aimed for older audiences while still having a lot for the kids to enjoy as well. Anyhow, that was the Transformers film series. I'm very tired of talking about this subject and editing hours of footage of Transformers stuff, but I still had a lot of fun making this series. Next week we're going to jump right back in with Suicide Squad, why it sucks. Also, sorry if this video took a little bit longer than usual, I had a lot to say so the script was a bit longer than normal, and I'm also quite busy with work and school, so bear with me if I end up being a little bit later than before on occasion. That said, if you're new and liked this, check out the other uploads I have in this series, and if you enjoyed, consider subscribing. I've been getting a lot of comments lately, but I try to reply back to all of them, or at least read them, so please, by all means, leave a comment and I'll be happy to read it. Um... I think that's it. Thanks guys. See you very soon.